Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our first webinar for 2017 in regards to this TAE course. I'll run you through a quick introduction to the way the, the system works. At the moment, the way I've got it, I can see some people on the left-hand side. So um, for everyone, um, hopefully with the screen that you have in front of you, it'll have a PowerPoint presentation and a chat window on the left. Uh, you will hopefully see that um, Alex has uh, said hello to everyone. Alex will be my technical support, uh, support this evening. Uh, we'll have Matt has said hello. Uh, we have Adrienne saying hello, which is great. And we've got some other people along the line saying hello as well. So that's excellent. So it looks like everyone is on screen. Uh, we can see each other. Uh, there'll be some other people that will join us over the coming weeks. But tonight we've got a fairly small group. Tonight's webinar will be pretty short and sweet. Uh, it's still in saying that there's quite a bit of content, but we'll use it as an introduction. Um, I'm actually going to double up and run another webinar tomorrow night um, around about the same time. I have emailed out the timetable to all of you in the last half an hour or so, but at the end of tonight's session, after we've gone through tonight's information, uh, we'll have a Q&A and we can talk then, but we'll certainly explain how we'll open up the portal to you guys over the next 12 hours and we'll get everything up and running as we get cracking through this course. You will notice in front of you an ability to type on the left. Everyone's got that. That's fantastic. You also have an interact button that you should have at the top of your screen. So if I am talking away and I ask a question and you want to give a short uh, response, by all means, hit that interact button. Uh, give me the the uh, emoji that, so to speak, uh, runs with that, and hopefully uh, I will see that and I can help you. And especially in regards, again, against uh, with tonight, I'll I'll be setting a cracking pace to get through this information, so I don't have you here till um, 10 p.m. So if I am going a little bit quick, you can certainly tell me to slow down um, or anything of the like. In regards to the whole sequencing of the units of competence or the subjects that make up this course, we are going to start this course with this particular unit. And it's known as TAE DES 402A, use, use training packages and accredit, accredited courses to meet clients' needs. Now, we're deliberately choosing this particular subject because we can use it as a an easy, soft introduction to this whole world of vocational education and training. And even though later on in the course, we we're going to be able to tailor it and specialize it back towards your particular area of teaching or qualifications that you want to use this teaching course in. For this first month or so of this course, we're going to get all the sort of, I guess, not heavy, but more generic um, industry-based, as in TAE-based um, information out of the way. So that way, uh, we kind of get the harder work done. Um, and then the rest of the course will ease out. So please understand that we're going to deal with some of the hard stuff early on, and then the course will have a, a lot uh, softer ending to it, which will be beneficial for everyone. So with tonight, we've already gone through the welcome. Uh, we're going to run through a quick overview of the tonight's uh, topics. I'll run through the session itself, and then we will have a Q&A at the end for you. When we look at what tonight is going to be about. First of all, we're going to ask ourselves and, and, and discover what is VET, uh, what are training packages, qualifications and units of competence, at the same time, why we have it and, and what is VET good for, um, and then how do we use it and how does that, I guess, interact with us wanting to become a VET trainer. Now, like I said, tonight is only a very small portion of um, everything that we're going to cover in this subject, and you will see on the portal over the next 24 to 48 hours, this webinar will be recorded and it'll be there for you. There will actually be more in-depth presentations using a different presentation program altogether called Prezi, which is, the I guess, the mother or father of what tonight's presentation is. So we create Prezi's, um, which we use normally in a classroom environment. And these webinar PowerPoints are a reduction of, of those larger presentations, kind of containing it to the important stuff that works best um, uh, hearing me talk about it or learn you, allowing you guys to learn uh, from uh, that presentation, but with the 
assistance of us having you know us explaining it to you and giving you an opportunity to talk about it before we get into the classroom and it just again picks up the classroom and puts it in your lounge room um tomorrow night tomorrow afternoon sunday morning or whenever you choose to look at this presentation once again so chapter one is an overview of vet before I get started, I actually am going to read to you the official unit overview, the official subject overview. Every subject or unit of competence, which you're going to learn about throughout tonight, every subject and unit of competence uh, that exists in our sector, in this, in this VET sector, has an official overview. I'm going to read that to you. At this stage tonight and, and early on through the course, these overviews um, will be uh, not confusing, but will be information heavy and, and it'll be very hard for you or slightly hard for you to completely decipher and understand what it's trying to explain. But by the end of the course, you'll be able to read these unit overviews and truly understand what they're trying to say and what it means and how you interpret it as a um, vet practitioner and go off and create a course or a qualification for a client um, and and do great from that and do wonderful things from that. So the official overview is, is that this unit describes the performance outcomes, skills and knowledge required to use training packages and accredited courses as tools to support industry, organisation and individual competency development needs. So what they're saying there is that if anyone comes to you and says, hey, we want you to develop a course for us or we need you to run this qualification, can you please put something together for us it's kind of saying that's what you're going to be doing. Uh, this unit typically applies to a person working in or with a training and or assessment organisation as an entry level trainer, teacher, facilitator or assessor. And that's the classic case of people who work for ITS. You uh, go through this course, you become qualified. We say, hey, you're fantastic. We would like you to work for us. And you would come onto a course and we would have everything you need to teach that course uh, ready for you. Um, it would be prepared for you, your, the assessments, the training materials, and you would be able to go off and do that job as a trainer. And what they're saying here is that this unit of competence is aimed at someone like you at the end of this course. It assumes that the person is working from a predefined training product, such as a training package or an accredited course, and applying that product to meet clients' needs. So it's that you're a, you're a trainer for a company, uh, everything is in place, they give you that and you go off and teach uh, a client, whether it's an individual or a classroom full of students from a particular company or organisation, and you can meet their needs. They get uh, from that training product uh, or that training program, everything they need to go back out into the workforce and work successfully. So that's what this unit of competence is all about. So tonight won't have much to do with driver training or customer service or any other particular industry that you guys want to end up teaching in, um, except for really the teaching industry, which is kind of funny because, and it's one of those things that you'll wrestle with all the way through this course, is that you are learning information and material as a teacher or as a trainer, despite the fact that you're a teacher or becoming a teacher. And that sometimes uh, can create um, some... Difficulties, uh, it can bend your brain in funny ways because you're taking on the information as a student, but you're trying to put it back in its place as a trainer, which is what you're going to be at the end of the course. So in Australia, we have categories for different industries, and each of these industries requires suitably qualified people uh, to fulfill all the different work roles and requirements to keep that industry rolling along. And VET is awesome at that. Vocational education and training is really good at that. VET achieves that goal by categorising and organising qualifications into their industry groups. So these groups have their own training packages. So each industry is organised into its groups and each industry has their own training package. And within that training package, there's all those qualifications. So a training package is a document or a place where all the different, different qualifications that serve different industries live. For instance, all the qualifications that have anything to do with transport and logistics live in the 
TLI training package from train driving to sailing to becoming a driving instructor. All these qualifications and everything that makes up those qualifications live in and can be found in the TLI training package. The same could be said for the HLT training package. First aid, nursing, and even re reflexology are all part of the health services training package or what it's, sh or it's shortened to be or known as the HLT training package. So hopefully already you guys have started to grasp that each industry sector has its own training package. If you've already got that, that's fantastic. That each industry has its own training package and within that training package, there's all the qualifications. So inside each training package can be hundreds of different qualifications. Qualifications come in all different shapes and sizes, from very basic qualifications to very complex. As we all know, each industry has people working at lots of different levels of responsibility and pay scales. And without an education system that recognises that structure, supports it by offering matching education and rewards the levels of gained expertise, uh, there'd be chaos and pandemonium. So if you think for a moment about a manufacturing plant, you think of all the different workers from the security guards to the people down on the line, uh, the payroll officers, the receptionists answering the phone, the accountants, the supervisors, the quality assurance officers and managers and, and all the rest of it, well, all these people have an important role to play and each worker would require a different skill set or education from the next. So training packages allows for the organisation and creation of individual qualifications for the individual job roles um, at the matching education level for all of those people involved. So the, the little factory worker guy um, who's just, you know, picking up two bolts and putting them in the, from the red box into the green box uh, to the guy who's working the machine behind him, to the cleaner that's walking past um, on an automated uh, sweeping machine or whatever the case may be, to the people in the office, to the supervisors and whatever the case may be, a training package working in consultation with that industry will have hopefully created qualification courses that allow all those people to go off and learn um, how to effectively do whatever that job role is so they can move from education into industry and be job ready. That's the whole idea of the VET sector. So each training package has many qualifications and qualifications are made up of units of competence. Units of competence are just another name for subjects. So even here tonight, while you do the TAE uh, Cert for qualification, which comes from the training and assessment uh, or from the training uh, uh, training package, so to speak, or the education training package, tonight's subject, tonight's unit of competence is one of those individual 10 subjects or individual 10 units of competence that you will com successfully complete on your way through to the end goal of the qualification. And for our driving instructors that are here, you've already done three TAE units, so you're only here to finish off seven. Stop pumping the air, everyone, going, yeah, you beauty, that's awesome. Uh, so once upon a time, um, you, you enrolled into a course and you did different subjects. Now you enroll in a course and you do different units of competence. In the end of the day, from a student's perspective, uh, nothing um, much has changed, uh, but that's where it's at. Cool. Um, believe me, I can understand that at some stages you may want to just, you know, mute me. Now, that reminds me, guys, you can see I deliberately read out what is on uh, these slides as a part of the webinars because it at least allows you guys, if you want, come Sunday morning or whatever the case may be when you want to revisit this uh, presentation, if you want to turn me off, you can. So it's exactly why I don't uh, keep open dot points later on. Um, later on, uh, when we talk about how to do presentations to groups and stuff like that, you'll hear me speak about how you don't want to have written text on a presentation so you're reading it out. But for this scenario, because it is a webinar that you could later on go back to and visit, um, I deliberately write what I'm going to speak about. So if you want to turn me down, you can still go through this presentation and get 
the vast majority of the information by reading it um, with the choice of turning me off. So here's an example of two of the qualifications that we um, run here at ITS. Uh, on the first table is the units of competence that make up a very short course, our level two first aid. Um, it's made up of two units, provide uh, cardiopulmonary resuscitation and provide first aid. So this is known as the HLT AID 003 course or the level two first aid course. And that has two units of competence or two subjects. And underneath on the table, on the table underneath is just as, is about half of, or not quite half of the units of competence that happen to make up the Cert 4 car driving instructor qualification. So you can kind of make sense that a short one to two day course might only have one to two units or a three month long course or a six month long course is going to have many units. Obviously, normally, generally speaking, the more complex a qualification is, the more units of competence uh, it will have to make up that qual. Um, I'm going to stop calling them subjects because I really want you guys to get your head around that they are units of competence. That's what we call them. We don't call them subjects. The units of competence that make up each qualification are specifically chosen after much debate and consultation with the matching industry, training providers, and any other stakeholders. Uh, stakeholders is a fancy name for anyone uh, that has an interest in that qualification or the workers of that qualification that, or the, the workers um, the qualification will produce. So in the last six to 12 months, with all of the closures of all those ripped off, ripping off um, RTOs that have been out there, and I'm, I'm sure uh, everyone would have seen probably in the last 24 to 48 hours that once again, one of those massive RTOs who are on, you know, uh, who are on 3AW on the TV every 30 seconds, they have gone into voluntary, uh, voluntary liquidation. Um, they're another uh, one of those massive RTOs that were uh, putting masses amount of people uh, through qualifications that uh, industry didn't really weren't really that probably happy with in the end. Uh, they had incredibly low pass rates. So late last year, the government said, we're going to stop paying you the government funding without worried about you. And as a result of that, they've just slowly but surely ran out of money and now they're in, um, in, they're in voluntary um, liquidation. So what we've seen in the last six months or so, and Alex and I went out to a meeting in Danny Nong, funny enough, late last year, where the government was saying, to be honest with you, now when it comes to qualifications, we're not going to ask what the public wants. We're actually going to ask what industry wants because you are the major stakeholders at the end of the day you are the people that are going to hire the people coming out of these courses so we're going to ask you what you need and want and then we'll actually go back to the training organizations and say hey this is what these guys want and need go make it happen beforehand that it was it was a much broader um a stakeholder envi um, environment you'd have the training organizations uh, associations, employment groups, and whatever the case may be, there'd be lots of people that would come in. Whereas now the government said, we've spent so much money on, on, on education. There's been so many RTOs, registered training organizations that are ripped off the system that we're over that. We're going to really go to industry, see what they want, and then come back to you guys and say, this is what you need to make happen. So there's a bit, there's positives and negatives out of that, of course. And especially from our perspective as trainers, um, sometimes we know a little bit better than industry, but at the same time, there's many times when industry knows a little bit better than us. And it, it, it is a better market when we all work together. So we'll see how this latest version works over the next year or two, but there will be much more industry involvement in the creation of qualifications. So for the driving instructor qualification, the Taxi Services Commission is a stakeholder, uh, the ADTAV is, and like I said, even Intelligent Training Solutions. Um, again, in the health sector, hospital boards or management, would be a stakeholder in the nursing qualification. Um, so it's not, <laughs> bad dad joke here, so it's not the dude holding the meat at the barbecue. He's not the stakeholder. Boom, 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 boom. I'm sorry for that very, very ordinary piece of humour that I thought at some stage when I wrote this would be funny. So anyway, I apologise and I'll never do that again. Um, so as previously mentioned, qualifications come in all shapes and sizes and they are categorised from certificate one all the way up to a doctoral degree. 
Um, and we'll talk about that uh, probably tomorrow night, to be honest with you. So one, th one thing that is common with Cert 1 to advanced dip diploma courses is that they're all made up of these units of competence. So in our world, in the VET sector, we mainly deal with courses that are between Certificate 1 up to advanced diploma, and those particular qualifications are made up of units of competence. Some qualifications are made up of core units with no electives. So once again, you're, everyone who's, who's in this forum who did the Cert 4 car driving instructor course, there was 11 units that you had to do and there was no choices in it. Um, in previous versions of that qualification, uh, we used to be able to add more, more units in there to make it a better, stronger qualification and, and create better, stronger um, uh, driver trainers for industry. However, they changed the rules. They said, no, 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 it must be only made up of these core units and we had to let that stuff go. And it's a little bit sad. I, I only had a lady the other day who we taught about seven years ago, send me her CV. And in her driving instructor course, she had the first aid units. She had fatigue management. She had um, units where we taught people how to check cars out because a part of your job is driving on a car every day and it makes sense that you have a special ability to or a higher ability to check your car and make sure it's roadworthy and safe to use. So we used to add in all these extra units to make these, you know, super powered driving instructors. But that got removed a little bit once they said no. That particular qualification um, must be only made up of 11 core units. So other qualifications have core units and elective units, and that helps students specialize or choose particular interests, just like high school. So all of us went through high school. We all got to year 10, probably year 10, year 9. They let you play a little bit with um, electives, but come year 10, 11, and 12, um, we're picking electives. We're trying to specialize our way through um, to higher education or whatever the case may be. We're all pretty um, uh, used to that. And that, that's what occurs uh, for some qualifications within the VET sector. Other qualifications have a combination of uh, core units and elected units that are organized into streams. So these streams are created when a, when a qualification is core to several job roles within an industry or workplace. Um, the majority of the qualification will be core to a student's ability to work effectively within the workplace. However, there may be a slight but specialised learning required by different job roles within that workplace. And a classic case would be a transport organisation. So some of these multi, huge, you know, organisations like Linfox, they'd have all their workers going through, say, for instance, the Cert 3 in uh, transport and logistics. Uh, that'll be a core qualification that they want everyone to understand how the transport and logistics industry works. And then there'll be special sounds for the guys who drive cranes, for the guys who drive over over dimension trucks. Uh, I know Lynn Fox don't do concreting, but there's like a concrete truck stream. So quite often, um, these industries will have a core um, qualification, and then there'll be specialised arms. And of course, for a company like Lynn Fox or um, Toll Transport, um, and even within the building sector and, and those areas, um, and even in the business services package, you think of all those people that would work in an office for a particular company, but they'd be all doing little individual specialised jobs. That uh, workplace probably wants everyone to have a core base of qualification that they all understand how to how to work in that workplace effectively to a point where then they have people branching off in their specialities. It just makes sense. It obviously makes, there you go. I'm even, I'm, I'm, I'm saying uh, logically what I'm going to end up reading. So it obviously makes sense that a workplace requiring people to have a baseline of consistent competence, yet be able to specialise within a field to help that business function successfully is vitally important. And is where that vocational edu education and training sector is most effective. It really is. Vet is, when vet's done right, um, and when it really is matching qualifications, units of competence and courses, to the needs of a workplace, it has significantly positive outcomes. It really is a great outcome. So qualifications, so, so training packages, what are they good for and why do they exist? So in the end, we have these specialised training packages um, feeding out to these industries and supporting these industries with, with workers that can uh, be uh, have a positive influence within that workplace. And this is probably the, the way we categorise th those four main points. One, so qualifications can be awarded to a public that have participated in assessment of their competencies, and I'll explain that later. Two, to allow and encourage the development of training to meet the needs of individuals. 
Three, to encourage educational pathways within workplace settings and environments. So important. We just don't want someone to do a course at the start, um, start at the bottom of the heap and have no ability to match aspirations with an educational pathway. We definitely want someone who can start at the bottom and through um, educational pathways, work their way right up to being the boss, so to speak. And that's, that's again, something that VET does very, very well. And four, to allow industries access to individuals that are workforce ready, despite not previously employed in that job role or particular area. And again, for, uh, for all the people uh, that are here uh, tonight that have been, uh, that have done the driving instructor course, all of you would have had expertise and experience in other areas. However, you came through and studied the Cert for uh, Driver Trainer qualification, and you were able to move straight from that course into industry um, and be a successful um, driving instructor. So that, I guess, within itself, your own private pathway um, is itself a classic case of the benefit of VET. Uh, and I'm sure maybe, Tristan, that has uh, something uh, similar to, to yourself, hopefully. Qualifications inside the training package. So with these qualifications, um, there is a little bit of um, uh, flexibility, and I guess this is how we categorize it. So RTOs are allowed to customize a qualification and their units of competence in order to meet their clients' needs. However, it cannot be a free-for-all and the integrity of a qualification cannot be compromised as a result of customization. Um, there are endorsed parts, the bits that can't be changed, and there's non-endorsed parts, which are the parts that can be modified. Now, in the Prezi presentation that this PowerPoint comes from, there's a whole extra section in there that explains endorsed parts and non-endorsed parts a little bit better. So come tomorrow night or, or Friday, whatever the case may be, um, even before Saturday, if you're going to attend Saturday's class, I'd recommend that you end up having a look at the Prezi presentation on the student portal, um, and that'll explain this little bit, um, this part here a little bit better. But what it's really just saying there is that at the end of the day, you're, you're allowed to um, modify some qualifications within <laughs> fantastic Tristan. Thanks, dude. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, the uh, yeah, the you're allowed to modify some qualifications, but you can never do it at the expense of what it's meant to be the, the goal of the actual qualification. It can't compromise the quality of the individual that leaves that course, um, and it certainly can't um, undermine the assessment requirements or the level of expertise that will be required. Um, for those people to have successfully passed that course. So at the end of the day, they can move into industry effectively. So the non-endorsed parts include the training material, assessment material, and the student learner guides. Now that's really, really important because come tomorrow night when I explain to you about how a unit of competence is written and, and what it means, so you guys can start to look at it and transfer that information into your workplace as you leave us. The amazing thing about these units of competence and especially um, the, the, uh, the parts of the assessment process that just can't be played with, the funny thing about VET is it says, Although we have these rigid, uh, these rigid lines in place, when it actually comes to the material you're going to use to train your students and uh, some of the, uh, the way you put together your assessments, um, that's up to you. That's actually the part we want you to create yourself. And the industry likes that because that's what allows us to all be a little bit different, allows us to tap into our own expertise and allows us to uh, compete on a quality level that we say, hey, you come and do this course here with us because you know, we believe we're the greatest. And then the next person will come along and say, well, we do this really well and this is why we're the greatest and you should study with us. So it is a great thing in a way that when it comes to the, the information being trained um, and the way the, the assessments are created, there is flexibility in there. Any customization of an accredited course must be within the course rules. These rules set out the limits to customization um, of the course by identifying the units of competency, which are essential to the completion of the qualification, possible sources of alternate units of competency, which may be substituted or added without further endorsement, 
And remember, endorsement means that you can't change it. It's rigid. Uh, the type and number of units of competency which may be added or substituted without affecting the overall integrity of the qualification and the extent to which units of competency may be modified without affecting the overall integrity of the course units or qualification. So like I said, some of the some courses are made up of cores and electives. Uh, this TAE is like that itself. Uh, within this TAE, you guys are doing a, a model that's very much uh, aimed towards a trainer who's going to be working with people. If you were doing a TAE course and you were clearly going to work, go and work um, in an online training company, then some of the units we're going to do out the back of this course, it would have been better if you did um, or we added online teaching components. But this particular stream, the, the way that we've modified this TAE for you guys is that we have added in the units that we could pick and choose from uh, that allows you to become the best trainer you can be training people face-to-face -face in groups. So you'll see towards the end, one of the subjects that we teach, it's not even a TAE subject, it's a BSB subject, and it's all about making presentations and how to make effective presentations. Because at the end of the day, if you're standing up in front of a classroom, you need to be able to make presentations rather than learn how to run an online webinar. So training packages have qualifications. Qualifications have units of competence. Units of competence tell us trainers what a student must be able to do or produce or understand to be deemed competent for that unit. How you teach and assess those units of competence is up to you. We just make, have to make sure we're doing it right, but more about that later. Tomorrow night, I'll walk you through a unit of competence and everything that um, I just talked about there. But funny enough, when it comes to these subjects, these units of competence, when we read these documents and we interpret them as trainers uh, working inside training organizations, these units of competence don't tell us what we need to teach. It actually tells us this is what this student needs to be able to do or produce or understand for you to say, yes, they can pass. How you get them to that point is the bit that's up to you. And that'll be obviously some of the stuff that we're going to work on and develop over the coming weeks. The other area within um, training packages are accredited courses. Now, accredited courses are developed to meet training needs that are not addressed by existing training packages. A course will not be accredited if it duplicates the existing endorsed training package qualifications or if the outcome can be achieved through the contextualization of a training package qualification. So what does this all mean? So beyond our Cert 3s and our Cert 4 uh, courses and our diplomas, there are these other courses that sit within the VEC sector that are called accredited courses. Quite often, accredited courses are very industry specific. It'll be a, a particular industry that had a particular uh, need because and it's a very specialized need. And when they said uh, to the government and to the um, industry training uh, councils and, and focus groups that are, um, that are companies or, or organizations that exist to try to um, match the training needs of, um, of industries to us training providers, they would have gone and spoken and consulted with these people and all the stakeholders, and they would have realized, hey, there's actually no qualification that exists for this particular job role or this specialization that we need. And when we look at all the thousands of thousands of units of competence out there, we actually don't think there's anything that we can gather in and make that happen. So they create these special one-off accredited courses. Um, quite often accredited courses are, are hard to find because sometimes an industry will pay lots of money for these accredited courses to be created and to have them accredited and then they protect them. They say, no, nah, this is not open to the public. We have spent a lot of money and a lot of time creating this. Only people that can train within our industry um, and our own people can train this qualification. And they use that in the end as a uh, money-making exercise, one, to get a return on their investment, investment um, and others will, um, yeah, and, and others will make it as, as they see it as a long-term, as a huge money-making uh, opportunity and exactly like um, Alex has put to me 
uh, in the corner. McDonald's was a classic case that they created accredited courses just for their own people. Um, some say that McDonald's were very clever in getting accredited courses at the time because it was probably other courses that were very similar to um that the people that worked for McDonald's could have done and been adequately qualified, but um, obviously they were really good at creating um, or convincing the government that they needed accredited courses. And then as a result of that, they were able to do that in-house training. And quite often within the building industry and a lot of those specialized industries, they have these courses and they're in some ways, they're, they're really good um, money makers for the industry. Um, to be able to be a master builder or to be able to be this particular person, you need to go off and do this accredited course. And with that, um, you get your, your extra accreditation. So there's a fine structure to accredited courses and that includes a descriptor. And that's what the accredited course is all about. The, the learning outcomes, uh, which is what a learner should be able to demonstrate as a result of, success, of successfully completing the accredited course. The assessment criteria itself, so what the minimum thing, uh, things or things or, or, or thing or so to speak that um, a student should do in order to demonstrate that they've passed this accredited course. And then the context and resource implications for assessment and considerations required for successful assessments. That last statement again will make more sense to us in a week or three. All righty. Um, what I have just realized guys is that definitely Back at the start of the um, this presentation, there seems to be a couple of slides missing. And one of the things I wanted to talk to you about tonight, because it might be kicking in right now, is that it is absolutely impossible for you tonight to completely understand everything I'm talking about. So one of the early slides that I had was talking about cut yourself some slack tonight. You will need to because this information is quite technically heavy. Um, and I'm hoping, and it'll be great if you're all following this along and going, no, nah, I'm actually keeping up and this is great. Um, that's wonderful and that's a bonus. But I did want to say to you at the start of the night that as I go through this stuff, cut yourself some slack. And certainly you're going to need to cut yourself some slack over the coming um, month or two because there is going to be a lot of information that will be um, quite confusing, but it will end up making sense and finding its logical place within your brain as we go down the track. And I just wanted to say that right now because there has been some different times where I'm talking about stuff that, you know, I'm talking about stuff as if you meant to understand it, but we haven't even taught it yet. So please understand that there are going to be times when, um, yeah, <laughs> uh, when, uh, yeah, I'm going to be talking about stuff that just doesn't quite make sense yet. And uh, Adrienne, that is absolutely awesome. You're cracking me up. Um, foundation skills. Foundation skills are the underpinning communication skills required for participation in the workplace, uh, the community, and in adult education and training. Uh, language, literacy, and numeracy, or LLNN, is the traditional way of referring to the ability to speak, listen, read and write in English, and to use mathematical concepts. Every learner in the vocational education and training um, sector is going to have to face LLN, LLNN skills challenges that are particular to the industry that they're training for. Um, we know that without adequate skills in these areas, individuals often struggle to demonstrate their competence, that they're actually good enough to pass this subject or they're good enough to move into industry, either during uh, the learning program or once in employment. So the Department of Education and Training has just released a new foundation skills assessment tool. I actually plan to register ITS under that during the week. Um, that happens to be the link for it. I won't click on that link, but you guys will be able to do that if you like, or copy and paste that link later on to, to have a look at it. So I'm actually going to um, register us for that. And then I'm going to um, invite you guys to have go through that because it's now become a thing where we all need to do an LLNN test, so to speak, before or um, the first uh, four weeks of a course. So we make sure that if anyone here has any language literacy and numeracy um, issues that we um, can adequately support you in that before we get too far down the course. Chapter two, um, how, when, and where. Um, I'm going to keep on pushing on. Um, if you guys need a break for a second or whatever, just let me know and I can, I can slow down a bit. So chapter two, the how, when, and where. So obviously all these training packages, qualifications, units of competence, and accredited courses need a, a location of easy access. 
that lucky enough for us is a is a, is a website and it's www.training.gov.au um, and it's the dedicated website for locating training packages and all their smaller components all their units of competence all their qualifications and sometimes their accredited courses and and sometimes you'll 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 search an accredited course on training.gov and it'll be listed but it'll say hey you don't get access but at least you know it exists um, from this location, you can view, download and research almost every qualification in Australia. There's also lots of handy information that you can use as a trainer that'll help you understand some of the things I speak about during this course that you'll be like, oh man, what did he really mean by that? You can actually go to training.gov and look up those words and it's going to explain it to you. I don't know how often I use training.gov and some of the other websites around that um, as when I first joined the industry just to help me um, understand and remind me of what you know some of these words actually mean because vocational education and training has its own complete language without a doubt. So training packages and accredited courses have a limited life have limited lifespans. Obviously, it's imperative that any training undertaken by people wanting to join or remain employed in a particular job or industry are provided with training um, that's relevant and current to do that job role. Um, and industry and within that industry. And that's so important. If you think about it, obviously, you know, someone who became a mechanic 25 years ago, it would be terrible if an apprentice mechanic was doing that exact same course today. Obviously, qualifications need to grow and move with industry as technology and everything else improves. The qualifications got to be um, following that along. So by having sunset clauses on training packages and accredited courses, Industry, government departments and, tra and training providers are forced to communicate with one another and work collaboratively on keeping both the training packages and the accredited courses in line with what the public needs. At the end of the day, the public deserves to be able to enroll into a course that gets them ready for industry. And it's always been one of our pet peeves when it comes to this particular qualification that the thought that you did this course 100% online out of books with no teacher involvement just boggles my mind. It boggles my mind. And some of the other training providers um, out there used to say we'd hire these people. They tell us they're TAE qualified. They've done the whole course. They've done it 100% online. And beyond the bit of standing up in front of a class and being able to teach something, they have no deeper understanding of anything else because no one was there to explain things to them. So. Um, Without a doubt, that is why this is our last TAE 4010 course that we're running. And I didn't say the whole um, unit code there. Um, and it is going to, in the end, be replaced by a new one. Um, because, yeah, because, the again, uh, the government didn't have problems with courses like this, but they did have la huge problems with those 100% online courses where you don't see anyone. All you get given is a whole heap of books and you work by yourself. It's just impossible to get meaningful outcomes um, in that setup. So accredited courses usually have about a three-year lifespan unless an extension is granted. Training packages, due to their enormity, don't have a specific lifespan, but four to six year lifespan seems to be common with most areas. So again, I'll just reference the transport logistics training package for a moment. Again, you're talking about in the, within the transport logistics um, training package, you're talking about an area, it's Australia's largest um, employer of people. So the transport logistics industry is now Australia's largest industry. It's bigger than any other. And when you think about it, that particular training package has to teach people how to drive trains, fly planes, uh, captain ships, drive a forklift, work in a, in a, in a um, warehouse, become a driving instructor, and it goes on and on and on. Railway mechanics, diesel mechanics, railway mechanics, all these different job roles would sit inside the transport and logistics training package. And all those qualifications are meant to come under some sort of constant review to improve them across time. So you can imagine when they say, here is the latest version of a training package with all these qualifications that, uh, that are inside of that make it up. That's a constantly dynamic environment because as one particular qualification becomes outdated because there's either been a change in industry or there's been a huge update within technology or whatever the case may be, that needs to be, that needs to be updated. So sometimes within these training packages, 
um, it's like a, it's like a, I don't know, like a bag of worms almost. There's all this squirming going on inside of people working within the, all those qualifications and reviewing them, improving them, and updating them. And then you have us training organisations on the outside having to come in, uh, see what the changes are, adjust everything we do back out to the public, so the integrity of the whole system uh, remains. So generally speaking, there is about a, usually a 12-month handover from an existing training package to the introduction of a new one. However, funny enough, last year with the TAE or with the, yeah, with, the, with the education training package being updated, with the transport logistics training package being updated, with the health um, training package being updated, I think there was, and there was also the area of um, the sports uh, area, and, and a few others that the government said, well, there's so many changes going on at the moment. They're actually going to give you an 18 month extension on moving from uh, one training package or the update of one particular qualification to another. So in my lifespan of, of training in this area, I've never seen an 18 month handover until last year. And I've got to be honest with you, I think some of those 18 month handovers might even be extended out further because I still see some gray areas with some of the qualifications and they haven't quite been uh, rectified. So it'll be interesting to see um, how that comes along and where that comes along. It is therefore imperative that as a trainer and assessor, you ensure that you are working with the current version of any training package, accredited course, qualification or unit of competence. Um, I'll show you how to find that information um, during the next session. Um, however, at different times, you may be training a superseded unit. So you'll go into this website, training.gov, You'll look up a particular unit of competence and it'll say, hey, it's superseded, but it won't have reached its final teach out. So it'll be in that 12 to 18 month handover period. Um, and they'll say you can keep on enrolling students into, uh, up until this date. After that date, you can't enroll anyone else into the course. However, you have another three months or four months or six months or whatever the case may be to get them to finish that course or finish that unit of competence. And that's exactly what's occurring with you guys right now. We're, we're almost in the, well, we're kind of in the teach out phase for this qualification. Um, it doesn't hurt us because the industry is still more comfortable with this qualification and accepts this qualification and wants this qualification as its benchmark in, in virtually every area. Um, uh, besides the new one. Now, once the new one kicks in and whatever the case may be, there'll be a filtering of that. But at the moment, um, especially in our areas that, that, that everyone's enrolled in this course is working in, this particular qualification is the, is the one that perfectly suits your needs. Chapter three, competency standards. So we're almost done, guys. Chapter three is not so big. So competency standards define the requirements for effective workplace performance in discrete area of work, work function, activity, or process. What the hell does that mean? That, guys, is a perfect paragraph of the vocational education and training sector. It has this crazy language that is, is quite hard to understand. And all it is saying is this. A competence, competency standard is the level of expertise or ability um, that we want your student to be able to do for a particular thing um, at any stage, so to speak. And when your students are able to do whatever you've taught them correctly on their own um, on multiple occasions, then you'll be meeting the, the, the competency standards. So they are used as a basis for divine, to defining the learning outcomes and assessment benchmarks within the vocational education and training sector. And again, as we finish this subject and go into the next cluster, the assessment cluster, we're going to understand how when we read these units of competence, they tell us the benchmark, they tell us what our students need to be able to achieve and do and understand to be deemed competent to be deemed a pass. So we don't kind of pass or fail people. We, we deem people competent. They're either competent or non-competent in, in the vocational education and training sector. Um, and those with certificates, you know, that have trained in this area and got certificates and the like, you'll see that quite often you'll have a COM or an NC or a C as your pass mark. It's not an A, B or C because in this area, you tend to be either competent or not competent. Company standards are expressed in outcome terms. They specify the knowledge and skill and the application of that knowledge and skill to the standards of performance required in the workplace. 
So again, in plain English, that's saying, hey, if you're going to teach someone how to use this machine, when they're using that machine, producing um, the correct things that that machine is meant to produce, this person is demonstrating competence, you've done the right thing. And you'll the machine's manual, you'll have read the unit of competence and will say, this person needs to create you know, 100 widgets per minute uh, using this machine free of error without any um, help from anyone else. And, um, and that is exactly what you'll measure against. So competency standards have a set format defined by the Department of Education and Training. They are our units of competence, which I'm going to explain to you tomorrow night. Um, and they also are referred to as units or units of competency. There you go. I'm, I'm ahead of myself. Competency is the consistent application of knowledge and skill to the standard of performance required in the workplace. It embodies the ability to transfer and apply skills and knowledge to new situations and environments. And it includes the following concepts. It comprises the application of specified skills and knowledge relevant to that occupation. It makes appropriate reference to the required generic skills. And again, guys, don't be too worried about keeping this information inside your brain. I'm going to explain this all more in more detail tomorrow night. It covers all aspects of workplace performance. And it can be demonstrated consistently over time and covers a sufficient range of experiences, including those in uh, simulated or institutional um, environments. So in real in a classroom, um, within a workplace, um, within a mock environment. To keep it simple, all of us here know how to drive. If we were to take someone through a roundabout once and they happen to do it right, and all they did was ever go through an empty roundabout once, it would be ridiculous to sign that person off as someone who can safely negotiate any roundabout they're ever going to come across again. It's just not enough. Um, they, we can't deem them competent because they haven't covered off all these criteria enough. And that, will again, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about more when we learn about assessments. But when we talk about competency and what it takes to do something right, we have to ask ourselves and understand that it's um, looking at the function understanding everything that it takes to do that correctly and seeing someone do that not just once, but consistently over time. When analysing a unit of competency, you need to identify the dimensions of competency. Uh, the concept of competency includes all aspects of work performance, not only task skills. So again, if we take that, if we break that down to the driving task, because again, everyone here can drive a car, being able to drive towards a roundabout, check a mirror, happen to brake and slow down, then accelerate and steer around the roundabout, they're only the task skills. But the total work performance of understanding, you know, what a give way sign means and what give way rules and road rules we need to apply um, on the approach to the intersection and when we get to the intersection and understanding how to work out what's a safe gap and what's a dangerous gap and when we need to slow down to avoid an accident, all that thought process that helps someone get through that roundabout safely is actually the total work performance. It's the complete package. Just the ability to physically do something, the task skills, is not enough to say someone is competent. So being competent means more than performing a skill in isolation. It involves some fairly um, specific uh, dimensions, which include task skills, performing specific work tasks at an acceptable level consistently um, and over a period of time. Two, Task management skills, demonstrating the ability to manage a number of different tasks that make up the work skills. So for us, again, I'm going to go back to a driving analogy. Um, we're heading towards a roundabout, being able to check your mirrors. Let's say we're turning right at a roundabout, an ability to check your mirrors, put your signal on, brake gently, understand, uh, you know, uh, recognize any road markings or, or road signs, look out for pedestrians and cars, um, then turn around, uh, steer the car, slow down and steer, steer the car competently around the, the roundabout and then accelerate. All those things coming together um, and all done effectively just as well is that whole ability um, within that, that task management skills that we can do all of them at once, not just one or two things and, and not be able to do the others. And for our driver trainers and for Tristan in the area that you do training, 
you'll do some training and you'll notice that you know the people can do one or two or three parts of what you're teaching them but not the whole level of it and at that stage under the dimensions of competency that what it takes for someone to truly demonstrate that they're good at something and they can be ticked off as pass and they can do it in the job in the in the in the workplace within their job role um, you go, no, that's not quite right yet. There's four things that are really important to to do this job correctly. And at the moment, you can only do two of them. Not that you would tell them that, but that's what you're looking at as a trainer. Three, contingency management skills. So that's responding and reacting appropriately to work issues and problems. And that's a big thing. Workplaces want people that are able to um, be flexible and when something doesn't quite work right, that they can react to it in a positive way and work around it and still get the job done. Uh, funny enough, this, this afternoon, um, I just came from um, one of the university and tonight we went there and we listened. They welcomed us and they listened to us. Uh, they, they put up some presentations and they were kept on talking about this all the way through. They were saying, we're really proud, you know, here at this university, we've just created this uh, job ready, so to speak, program. And he kept on saying that we've gone and talked to industry and all the people, and they keep on telling us that this contingency management skills is really important. And it pricked my ears up because one, I knew I was going to talk about it tonight. And two, it was interesting to see that universities, in some ways, were catching up to what the vocational education and training sector, that Cert 1 to Diploma or Advanced Diploma level qualifications, were already working on. That we have this thing called the dimensions of competency. And a part of that, it, it, when we deem someone to be past something, is that they can react appropriately to problems. Four, job role environment skills fulfilling a range of responsibilities and expectations in the workplace, including those related to generic or soft skills. And then five, transferable skills, being able to utilize skills, knowledge and skill sets in a range of different situations and contexts. And pretty much tonight at this university, they had this big presentation and pretty much what they talked about, this whole new program that they've, they're have they gonna deliver and create for all their university graduates, um, and especially these people are part of this Aspire program, was really the dimensions of competency. It was just like, wow, I'm actually gonna talk to you guys about this tonight. And here's this university that said they've done a five year um, research into what you guys will already know. So. As a trainer assessor trying to research and deliver a training program to a prospective client, because at the end of the day, this is what this subject's all about, learning what a training package is, what a qualification is, and a unit of competency is, so you can go off and when we ask you to go and find a, 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 an appropriate qualification for this client base, you'll be able to do that. So it'll be important that you can determine what level of qualification is suitable to meet the client's needs. Obviously, a training program that underqualifies or overqualifies participants will have dire consequences in a myriad of ways. So, and that's a big thing. We can't underqualify people, and we also don't want to overqualify people. Uh, Cert one through to advanced diploma are the usual qualification levels that TAE trainers like us will operate within. Um, we will look at the qualifi um, qualification levels in more detail next time, um, probably tomorrow night, if not Saturday. Um, However, it's important to remember that the qualifications rise on a sliding scale. And while I'm here, it's also uh, important to understand that um, the Prezi presentation that this comes from has a complete rundown of this information. So for example, Cert 1 is a very basic level and matches undertaking fairly simple tasks within their workplace. Uh, diploma and above would be the qualification usually assigned to managers, supervisors, and people who require complex thinking abilities as part of their everyday job. So like I said, within a factory, someone um, working on the factory line might do a Cert 1. Um, and of course, the manager in the office, he's probably done a diploma or advanced diploma, if not a higher education uh, qualification. So in this presentation, we've explored some of the basic information in relation to training packages, accredited courses and units of competence. Um, ensure that you follow up this presentation with any, other, other, uh, any of the other learning material that is found um, on the portal. And like I said, we'll open that up to you guys in the next 24 hours. And always feel free to contact us at any stage when required anyways. All right, guys, well done. I hope that helps. I hope I didn't go too fast for you. I tried to, I wanted to get that done in around about 60 minutes. So it looks like we've uh, come pretty close to that. Um, as I said, if you can go away tonight saying, you know what, I understand that industries have training packages. Training packages have qualifications and accredited courses and these qualifications are made up of units of competence, and these units of competence actually tell a trainer what a student needs to do to pass to be deemed competent, 
um, that'll be fantastic. You'll have absolutely positively um, gone beyond all expectation. Industries have training packages. Training packages have qualifications. Qualifications have units of competence. Units of competence tell us trainers what students need to be able to do as a result of our training to be deemed competent, which means that they pass. You have that, you leave that, you've hit it out of the park, people. Thank you very, very much for listening tonight. We'll open up the mics or you can type in a, a, an answer, a question if you like. Otherwise, we'll bid you good night and we'll go, but we'll give you a few minutes to type away or ask something. Thank <laughs> you.